Greetings and welcome back. We're here again. And welcome to the Music and Humanity for the Metaverse Roundtable Discussion. We have three guests that are with us today and we'll be sharing more about who they are, what they do, and then we'll kick off the proceedings. In the meantime, speakers, we ask that you mute your mics until we open the session up. First with us is Amy LaMare of the WXR Fund. It's a managing partner with the fund itself. Amy is the managing partner in the WXR Fund, a venture fund investing in early stage companies that are transforming business and human interaction using spatial computing, VR, AR, and AI. Their entire portfolio is comprised of female founders and gender diverse teams across industries, including retail, healthcare, training, remote work, real estate, and education. Amy is the author of Sound and AR in the book Convergence, how the world will be painted with data. She has been interviewed by Wire Magazine on virtual concerts, and Amy often speaks and writes on immersive music trends and has participated in several podcasts on the opportunities of spatial computing and virtual music experiences. Amy is also a mentor, an angel investor, in several music tech startups. And we also have with us Celeste Lear, but for many of you know, DJ Celeste of Boutique Electronic Music. She's an event producer, a music immersive experience designer, a music director, an artist. Celeste is a Los Angeles-based XR professional with two decades of discipline within the digital entertainment, concert, nightlife, and audiovisual world. She has led various teams and worked on groundbreaking projects with world-renowned production crews to turn out consistently well-planned and executed futurist events, including that of high-tech, multimedia installation experiences, video mapping, conferences, festivals, nightclubs, and concerts, both physically and in VR in the metaverse. Her work is also centered with boutique electronic music. It's also centered around the most current tech and trends for AV, sound engineering, performance, music curation, direction, and broadcast. She has a special passion for projects around environmental sustainability, human connections, and the arts. Up next, we have Tony Parisi, the Chief Strategy Officer, the Metaverse Pioneer, Entrepreneur, Author, Musician, and Lamina One, the Metaverse OG himself, the former head of XR Ads and e-commerce at Unity Technologies, author, musician, and composer. Tony Parisi is a Metaverse and Virtual Reality Pioneer, an entrepreneur, investor, author, he has co-created several international 3D graphic standards, including VRML, X3D, and GLTF. Tony is the author of O'Reilly Media's foundational books at 3D graphics and VR, of learning virtual reality, programming 3D applications in HDMI and WebGL, and WebGL up and running. One of the leading spokespeople for the immersive industry, Tony has given speeches in multiple countries about industry trends and innovation in augmented reality. He was named in Next Reality's 30 People to Watch in AR in 2020. Tony is currently serving as Chief Strategy Officer at Lamina One, a new Layer One blockchain for the metaverse. He's also an advisor and limited partner in early stage venture firms, including Me Ventures, a future focused investment fund providing opportunities for creators to grow and succeed. And previously, Tony was head of XR Ads with Unity where he oversaw strategy and product for the company's real-time 3D brand, advertising, and, commerce, and commerce solutions. With that, he's also a composer and musician. He's currently finishing the cast recording for Judgment Day, a full-length original music that has several other music projects underway. But to that end, and to the beginning, welcome all of our panelists. We are happy to have you with Gatherverse 3M, Music meets the metaverse. For the audience listening, we'll be posing a series of questions that we'll be introducing and asking. And we're gonna kick things off and we are going to rock the mic. But starting off with the first question, Tony, what advancements might you be seeing with regards to the metaverse 
as it relates to the music industry itself? Oh, there's so many. And good morning, Christopher. And hi, Amy and Celeste. Good morning. This is great. This is great. I got to tell you what an awesome kickoff this morning. That was really thrilling. Thank you, Christopher. We were all just dying over here watching you and listening. Uh, there are so many innovations going on in music, and I'm sure the other panelists will be able to, to chime in on this soon enough. Um, on the when we talk about the metaverse, we're talking about so many things these days, right? I mean, in a sense, we're talking about where everything in human communication is going, where the internet's going, where production and entertainment are going. And a big driving force in that is music. And that is everything from, you know, live music experiences being enhanced with all kinds of amazing digital technology, projection mapping, for example, um, to immersive experiences that are created with spatial audio, real-time 3D graphics, full virtual environments, potentially using augmented reality where you can use your phone or a pair of glasses to see digital content combined with the real world. I mean, the list is kind of endless on the sort of production side of creating experiences. And then we get to how they're delivered and how they're monetized. You know, we've, we're already starting to talk about Web3. Um, creators are going to have new ways to make money. Uh, we're seeing a lot of disruption and distribution. So there isn't an aspect of the music industry and the, the creative endeavor of music that's not going to get touched by all these technologies that come together to this, in this thing we call the metaverse. Absolutely. Celeste, in what ways do you see the metaverse changing the music industry right now? Well, there's there's so many. Um, I would say from an artist standpoint, one of my personal favorite parts was being able to kind of like live out your fantasy concert and dream up your um like a dream stage scenario and um kind of sky's the limit creative opportunities for expression uh, bringing more expression and, and art uh, into the metaverse and i also like the fact that i think that the metaverse will um offer up more opportunities to for fans and interaction for um, fans to be able to po potentially contribute to uh, even like production or come up with ways um, to help design a concert or um, come in, in as an avatar and interact more. Um, I've been to some concerts recently in, in VR where the crowd was able to even control the effects that were happening on the dance floor, um, on the stage. Um, there's so many different creative methods for both artist and for fan that I think we're going to be seeing a lot of. Amy, coming from your lens and from where you're looking at, especially with the WXR fund, as Tony and Celeste have both chimed in already early on what we're seeing when it comes to music. Let's run that back from your lens perspective, which is very unique and, and very obviously different from what we tend to see in this industry. What advances might you be seeing in the WXR fund, if you will, when it comes to regards of the metaverse as it relates to the music industry today? Mm -hmm. One of the things I'm most excited about is accessibility and just the um, the the fact that these concerts or these music events are happening uh, and can be reached by anyone from their homes versus, uh, you know, in particular, you talk about traveling to um, Burning Man or Primavera or some sort of live music festival or even just a concert in your town. Um, it just it really opens up the ability for so many more people to participate. Um, from an investment perspective, obviously, we're looking at how does the technology that that is being created now, how is that growing? How is that being accepted by uh, a large number of people? And, you know, how will that shift over time? And what, what companies are the ones that are going to take um, are, are going to ride that wave um, as as the users, as the fans um, as the artists are ready to to join the metaverse, and many, many of them are. We're seeing, you know, more more and more every day. Absolutely. And panel, let's run this through an open question, and audience, draw in with us because Amy just mentioned accessibility. How do musicians access the metaverse? And we've asked this question, I know, to our own selves those that may have been in the music industry and that are, and some musicians may even say. First of all, what is the metaverse? And when I do find out what it is, how do I access it? And what benefit might it leverage me? With audience, we've seen great 
different transitions happen in this space. It seems that we've gone from Napster to Rhapsody Music to Spotify to Apple Music, and now even Spotify and Apple are wondering, what might we look like inside this metaverse? But that said, let's take it to the artist. Open question, how can the metaverse be highly accessible to the independent artist? I feel like Celeste should start that. I have a lot of opinions, but. Yeah, uh -huh. I would say like um, uh, the independent artists, I think that the the majors are gonna have a, a advantage, like, a di like as they always do, because they have the big stars and the big money for the mega concert production and promotion. But where I think the in indie artists can come in on a more like grassroots level. And these are also different ways to perform and reach an audience that I think they're going to be uh, more readily accessible as the technology advances. And um, I think that I think a good example would be that the uh, Epic Games uh, purchase of Bandcamp. So this is an example of how the gaming industry is also going to potentially um, help independent artists in, in more, I'm, we're thinking more licensing opportunities. Um, a lot of us were maybe a little confused why Epic bought Bandcamp and it just seems like they, they could potentially form alliances and help more artists to place their music and get more um, revenue from licensing opportunities and, and, ex and also more exposure. Can I build? Can I build on that, Celeste? Because uh, yes. I, I know we're going to throw a bunch of stuff at, at everyone right now, but I think they're all kind of connected. I'm glad you brought up Epic and Bandcamp because that was a head scratcher for a lot of folks. If you <laughs> think about it, the way people think about Metaverse purely as like Fortnite or 3D gaming, but actually, and I'll get to this in a minute, that's not what I think of the Metaverse as at all. Um, and I think we're in it right now, even in these chats we're having on video, but it's just a very, not very 3D version of it. We're evolving our way toward a much more immersive version of it. So when you look at, you know, Epic, who's got the premier game engine as well as Fortnite, you, you wonder about something like Bandcamp, which has got nothing to do with those media types, nothing to do with gaming, really. But it's clearly part of their broader agenda at a, at a high level to engage independent creators and help them succeed. And so from that thread, it's really consistent. And it's also indicative of where, in my opinion, the metaverse is happening today. And it is not in Fortnite. It is not in Roblox. Those are metaverse-like, they're 3D, they're game-like, and they technologically and experientially are like what our future metaverse is going to be. But the actual metaverse of today is people on Twitter, people in Twitter spaces having chats, doing live concerts in Twitter spaces, on Discord stages and hitting refresh on OpenSea to see how their NFTs are doing. That's what's going on in the real world of the metaverse today. So slight counterpoint, finally, to play off Celeste again, the slight counterpoint to your thing about the uh, majors having an advantage, I kind of see the advantage toward the indies right now. Mm -hmm. They've got the agility. Uh, they've got the drive. They only need to reach a few thousand, in Kevin Kelly's terminology, a few thousand fans to start succeeding and getting paid in ways and it, and it amounts that they couldn't during Web2. The platforms, the big platforms like Spotify, the streamers on the heels of file sharing, basically we're putting a knife into all of these independent artists. And, and Web3 gives them a hope that they can actually succeed, you know, start making a living and finally thrive again. So I think when you look at action on the ground, that's where it is today. It's going to get a lot more intense production wise and graphics wise. But that's where I think the, the world is today. And a lot of startups in this space right now trying to figure out how do we work with independent artists to, to allow them to engage in the metaverse. And you're seeing companies like wristband, like noise VR, um, and then bigger companies, you know, uh, Microsoft bought Altspace a while ago and Altspace has been a huge supporter of live events. You'll see, you know, focus doing hip hop in VR. Reggie Watts had a, a six week stint there during the pandemic. So, you know, definitely seeing um, more immersive VR based um, metaverses trying to um, engage as well. Um, and AR folks like Encore. Um, yeah, so there's there's a lot of players in the space and we'll just have to see how, you know, how easy they can make it for artists to engage and, and fans.
Absolutely. And to our audience, we join you and welcome you as we're having this discussion on music and humanity for the metaverse. We're touching on right now the ideas of what is the metaverse in the eyesight of what it actually is um, beyond what it is that we tend to think that it might be and getting more to more of a realistic and managed understanding of our expectations on what it is today and for perhaps future expectations and how the independent artist navigates their way into this space because without our independent musicians it puts us in a very interesting situation of a lack of music which the independent musician is the one that generates all of music if you will even some of the biggest names we have heard and that we enjoy and care so much for tony uh, they once started off as an independent musician at somebody's club, Amy, at somebody's nightclub, Celeste, um, perhaps at a DJ table. They were enshrouded by a few people, and some have come to embrace them in the millions. With that said, we also look at the independent artists or the major labels. Both have a role to play, but I'm going to throw this one out there. Does music in the metaverse benefit the independent artist? or the major label more, or should we be looking at this different? Well, again, I think right now, like I said, I think advantages to the uh, independent artists because they have the energy to try all these new things, you know, and they don't need to reach so many people to, to have some kind of success. You know, will that play out in the longer term? I don't know. And even, even within independent artists as i'm seeing in the chat right now as time's pointing out there's a bit of a digital divide right i know we're probably going to get into dei in a bigger way in this conversation but even to participate in web3 for example you've got to figure out all this wallet stuff you have to have the certain kind of computing power um so it's not clear that you know is is it, it seems more egalitarian than maybe what we had in some areas of web2 but it's not a really level playing field still so maybe that's the question to explore I mean, you know, how, how independent can we get and how accessible will this be for everybody to be able to participate? I don't have an answer to that. Indeed. And so let's switch on to that subject. When we talk about accessibility, which is a big focus of Gatherverse, but we also talk about equality, equal footing, equal standards. I think we can all attest that there's brilliant and incredible musicians, latent, in all different types of global communities. If they just had access to have the right type of tool and utility and education. Um, we have our good friends with Karen Alexander having an educational summit in a couple of days from now to talk about education and XR. Let's chop a little bit of wood in that direction. When we start thinking about inclusiveness, Celeste, what action should be taken to ensure inclusiveness when it comes to the metaverse and music? Uh, absolutely. I th so I think that um, accessibility to the various platforms um, that host music and, and have um, opportunities for um, concerts and creation, um, but at the, the platforms not just being um, headset accessible, but also accessible in 2D mode on Mac and PC, uh, as well as a smartphone. And I think that's something that I think is going to help to increase like accessibility and inclusiveness globally. I think that um, anyone that's pricing uh, events online um, um, should not gouge the fans. I think that there should maybe even be tiers or things that I think we'll see that coming up um, or just free concerts that where the promoters are, are concentrating on advertising money. And uh, I think that also publicly accessible industry events, there's a lot of them going on that help to educate uh, people about the metaverse. I think that that's gonna be something, um, and it, it already is where people can latch on and, and learn a lot. And I think that's something also really important that's not talked about a lot is um, the gear providers, like people that are providing us gear to access the metaverse, they should have more of a sense of responsibility to build quality product that lasts a long time and it's not just going to be breaking you know after the first year or two we get it that also comes down to sustainability factor um but yeah those, those are my thoughts <laughs> when we start talking about the different vendors that will uh no doubt be part of building this metaverse i i have to i have to throw this out there because 
a lot of times when we listen to our music and enjoy it, we simply turn on our phone and our Spotify, if you will, or perhaps a vinyl on a Friday evening in the living room, and we play the music. But there's a lot that happens to make even one song, let alone an EP or LP. Let's kind of venture off into that. And I have to ask, Tony, you have a background in the history of music. When you think about the process of what it takes to reach from one end to the other, do you believe that the metaverse and technology today will be more of an assistant to the musician to make accessible choices and accessible of information and a better pathway forward? I can imagine how, what it may have been made through the lens of REM and the eighties, Amy, and, and transitioning and going and of any musician just trying to make it a breakthrough and knocking on doors for opportunities. Does it get better for our musicians of today, Tony? Yeah, I'll start this off. Yeah. So I think there's a lot more hope. I think there's a lot more hope than, you know, so so the era of file sharing and the streamers really did, and then COVID was just the final blow on this stuff, really did hurt uh, working musicians. They became conditioned that, oh, well, you know, your music itself, the intellectual property, the create the creative product of your creative process is effectively worthless other than as a promotional tool for you to get on a stage so people can see it live, pay for tickets and sell T-shirts and merch. That was how the artist was going to make money. Everyone was conditioned to that for about 20 years because of Internet technology and some, you know, sort of knee jerk, uh, uh, you know, and just ill conceived attempts to do some of this right without without protecting the rights of the artist on their creation side. Some people could argue that copyright's not a good idea. I, I, as an artist, I disagree with that. Um, of course, the, the value and how it's generated from that can change. Uh, so now we're looking at an area, and, and so back to, when you look back at the golden age of the record labels, they preserved that. They, they controlled the means of production and distribution and billing monetization. Um, to the benefit of several artists, but it was not a level playing field and it was not a really equitable relationship anyway. But in the era of the web, we started looking back on that as the golden age, unfortunately. So now we'd like to see if we can get back to a place where creators get to keep more of what they make, but the tools for creation, distribution and monetization are more democratized. So there's more choice for a greater number of artists. It's, I don't think anyone's naive enough to think there's still not going to be, you know, people at the top, platforms that control a certain amount of money and all that. I think when you look at it as a, you know, that curve, though, that long tail you hope has a higher elevation, that there's more people who are participating in it and they're actually reaping more of the rewards of that ultimately. So that's the hope. Uh, you know, how we get with there with all these tools, I'm not sure. I, I just say the one promising thing is, you know, logic costs $200 now. GarageBand is 20 or 30, whatever it is. I mean, the creation tools are, are very affordable. Um, you can produce a record at home for a few thousand dollars, which is still out of reach for a lot of people. But if you're a working musician, you can make a go at that for a lot of uh, most people. And then uh, distribution is changing again. And these new pla these big platforms are going to have a day of reckoning. I mean, they'll adjust. Probably we're seeing Spotify, you know, making noise about NFTs, whatever. But I think you're going to see all that disruption and distribution and payments to go along with creation. So I, I think it's a very hopeful time. It gives me yeah, optimism. I, I agree. Just to add to that, Tony, I mean, I'm fascinated to see how NFTs and blockchain are going to change how uh, songs are consumed and so and and the payment um, uh, is given back to the to the artists. I mean, you're seeing Sound XYZ and Royal and Groove Mint and Mint songs. Like, there's so many new uh, platforms for, uh, for this new distribution mechanism for music. And, uh, there, there's no clear winner right now, I don't think, but, um, but definitely with all of the, this, um, activity and, and technology there, there's a, going to be a shift in music for sure. And, and hopefully let's, let, let's hope this time it's a good one for artists. Let's talk about tools that was just made mention. We're on a roll and we're going to keep going. Uh, audience, as you know, there's uh, and, and, and DJ Celeste just, I'm so used to calling you DJ Celeste. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> I love uh, it. <laughs> that, that she made mention of Bandcamp. And for many of us, 
uh, that are in the music industry, we know what Bandcamp has meant uh, to many musicians in this space for so long. And it was a bit of a head scratcher as to why would such an acquisition happen? And we may be seeing more of this in, with the tools uh, that are coming out now. And uh, we're seeing a lot of different tools out there that are based specifically for music when we start thinking about XR, acronym audience, meaning extended reality for those that may not know. Uh, uh, Celeste, are the tools today sufficient enough in this XR ecosystem, the metaverse, if you will, are you seeing that they're sufficient enough right now for an artist to be able to create and expand their catalog of what they already have and to be able to create new music today? Or do you feel like the industry might be wanting for more? Uh, it's rapidly progressing, um, and I think it's just going to snowball. Uh, I really like to use uh, Tribe XR as a fantastic example of possibilities. Um, this is for the DJ world and potentially also music producers. But um, so the Tribe founders work directly with the pioneer uh, engineers to uh, create basically like emulations of the actual hardware as working software that you use with your hand controllers. And they basically created um, a, the same equipment that you would see in a world-class nightclub. Um, it, it's it's probably about $7,000 worth of gear that you get for $20, which is also kind of lending to the accessibility factor. Um, it was originally started as an educational platform for um, people to come in if they wanted to learn how to DJ. It's become a whole community and multiplayer rooms. Um, there's also the different types of um applications that are opening up where you can actually write music. The first one I ever saw was called Lyra, V-R-L-Y-R-A. Mm -hmm. And I was so impressed. My friend Daniel Berkman was um, going to universities and working with Lyra and giving presentations. And he's a professional composer out of San Francisco who I just adore. And um, I, he, so I call these next level tools for creativity where um, you can create your, put your instruments all around you. You can set the sounds and you hit it with your digital hands. Um, you can record what you make. I think that some of these, I'm hoping that as a music producer, some of these will also have multi-tracking uh, so you can bounce down the sense files or stems from a song. Into, well, that'll be next, and right? Them. A real virtual DAW. We don't have that yet. <laughs> a lot of people are talking about doing that. Yeah, and also virtual recording studios. What's that going to look like where we can actually step in remotely and sound is, it, there's different systems to calibrate sound for recording so everyone sticks to one click track but people are even internationally jamming. Like the, this is the technology that's so wild. I mean, I'm already using a plugin for my recording where we're doing remote recordings. There's latency. So you're not playing together, but if someone's doing a vocal report performance in a remote studio, our producer's in LA, I'm in San Francisco, the artist is wherever. It's a very simple setup if they have Logic or you know any of these tools and they have a streaming plugin. It runs in your browser and you can hear the session as if you're in there with the performer. Yeah. So then if you're like me, the composer or the producer, Greg, you can give them feedback right on the spot and say, that was a little pitchy, try that one again, or to sing it with a little more you know, juice this time, you, you didn't quite hit the essence of the part kind of thing. That's amazing. And that's yeah, just was simple, like windows, like we're looking at now, you know, we're on Zooms and then we're streaming in another browser window. Uh, imagine what that's going to be like if we could be in virtual environments together, Celeste. Uh, Mind boggling. Yeah, it's going to happen, I think. <laughs> and then there are the tools that are adding the, the visuals as well. So something like Volta, where you can you're, you're seeing Pro Tools and Logic run right into a visual creator. And so instantly you have more of an immersive three-dimensional space. Um, it's really fun to see the different tools starting to work together. Yeah, Some, something that's really exciting, I think, is also um, the motion capture uh, for, mm -hmm. I was down at Red Pill VR uh, in Hollywood last week for an open studio that they had. And they had a DJ um, who has just, she just, it's a device that was very small, just right in front of her face. And it scanned her upper body and torso as she was DJing and scanned her into the nightclub environment that they created this really wild, fun, beautiful kind of forest, wild rave scene. Uh, and she was in there in real time. And you see her avatar and, and face, you know, facial expression and her moving around. Um, also, I think like holoportation and hologram technology, we're going to see a lot more of that coming up. 
uh, soon. Oh, we should talk for... to James and Yaz, me and Amy at Scatter for the depth kit about doing it for live performance like that. They're getting close to real time volume capture with these kind of technologies. Now you might want to elaborate on what Scatter's doing. Yeah, absolutely. So they're using um, Connect Xbox Connect devices right now, but ultimately we'll move into even more um, uh, accessible capture um, and just, just like a with few your devices webcam or something. Do, yeah, yeah. Um, just a few devices can capture a holographic image and stream it real time. So. Let's jump on something here real quick. Since we talked about tools, which we just got a load of information on, and it seems that we are delving into what's available now. Let's go to the other side of that because, uh, Celeste, you had mentioned something, but Amy, we're going to direct this at you for the moment. So let's mention about Tribe XR. Um, Tom Ippolani, as we probably all know him, has done a really fantastic job of introducing and migrating the world of DJism, if you will, into XR. I think he's done one of the better jobs in the world of what we've seen when it comes to this space. A tip of the hat to you, Tom. I think you're also here. We are talking just yesterday. So when we talk about... Um, Tom had a start. Mm -hmm. People that build tools for XR uh, mm -hmm. and technology, they also have a start. And they usually enter into a thing that we call startups. And Amy, we know that you know a little bit of something about that. Let's take it there for a moment. In the world of music, in general, when it comes to entrepreneurship, people want to know, what are the better directions and best steps for me to get started? I may not be a musician, but I want to contribute to the overall success of music because I love music. And if we had to say that probably the majority of the music industry is not musicians, it's people that enshroud and help build out and help really put and launch the careers of musicians themselves and build supporting tools and help maintain the disposition of this music. Amy, what are available resources that can be utilized for an artist musician, producer in the metaverse, who's seeking to take that step as an entrepreneur and wanting to go forward? Yeah, I mean, I guess my first suggestion would be to try all the things that exist today. And um, you know, there's a couple of different ways to discover that. The easiest being just make a Google alert on VR music or immersive music, and you'll get updates on a daily basis of, the, the new things that are happening um, and see how quickly this space is um, is emerging. Uh, uh, at some point I was doing a monthly newsletter of all the music news, immersive music news. Maybe maybe Christopher, you're inspiring me to do that again. Um, but that please, Amy, I would like that, please. Yeah, it was great. Um, but there, there's just so much happening day to day, week to week. Um, in a positive way, right? That we're seeing growth from lots of different startups uh, to help to engage and enable these artists to connect with their fans. Christopher, can I build on that and do a yes. bit of a shameless plug for ME Ventures? Yeah, so I joined as a limited partner and advisor to this new venture fund that's primary focus is to support uh, music technology for the creator economy. And it was born out of a conference called the Music Entrepreneurs Conference, founded by uh, Jalen Acosta and Rachel Carey in New York. Uh, they brought on a Silicon Valley investment partner named Paolo Privatera, and they've started an investment fund. And they're focused completely on music technology. It could be Web3, it could be Web2, it doesn't matter. It's all about whether it's helping with creation, uh, social platforms that help share music, distribution, monetization, banking even, because... You know, if you're a working musician, you want to get paid on PayPal or Venmo, it's kind of a cluster. So there's new payment systems, uh, possibly distributors that will take on Spotify, taking a whole look at that space and really informed by years of supporting uh, artists and technical entrepreneurs in the music industry. So I, I tell people to uh, encourage them to check out ME Ventures if you're thinking about starting something technological or production or distribution uh, in this new world. Uh, take a look and uh, the LPs will be happy to talk to you. So sorry, it's a plug, but it's also like there's there's movement there. So there's funds like Amy's that are very interested in this because of her passion in music. But now there's some, you know, pure play springing up to really focus on supporting new entrepreneurs. Yeah, Te Techstars Music is a good one too. Tech Not all, always know. immersive, but they tend to have several in every cohort. Amy, leaping back over to you, I, as long as I've known you, I know that you've been such a lover of music and a fan of music 
like heavily dedicated to it in this space, uh, not only in your work, but also in personal life. I, I, let's let's kind of run with this for a moment. I know that we talk about virtual worlds and there's a lot that's happening. You made mention of alt space and what Gavin and them were building off before uh, the Microsoft acquisition of it. And we've seen some progress happen with virtual worlds, not just in the development of them, but in the past 28 months, we've become more virtual than in the past 28 years. And so we do a lot more virtual communication now in ways that never that we that thought we would be doing perhaps this early. And from what Tony had shared earlier about what he thinks is the metaverse, this is a manifestation of the metaverse, if you will, as well, how we abide and how we communicate and with our audience in the chat thread. When we talk about virtual worlds and the listening and the experience of music, we know there's a number of platforms that are dedicating themselves towards presenting music and more culture and perhaps NFTs and things of that nature and amalgam building together. Are virtual worlds from your lens at the moment, are they the next rendezvous destination for music experiences when it comes to potential mass ingress? Yeah, so I still think there's going to be a transition and virtual worlds, as you know, Tony was pointing out earlier, can be described as anything from a Fortnite and a Roblox. And we've seen with Trevor Scott and Marshmallow how big those concerts can be, um, millions of people joining to, you know, something like Wave, which has also had millions. Um, but again, ne neither of those headset based to something like Stageverse, which had headset or or on a flat screen. The, I think one of the keys here is usability, right? So not necessarily, I mean, there's some overlap with accessibility, but, but how easy is it to engage and use? And therefore, how easy is it, can you get your friends in there? Because I think the social component is absolutely key for yeah. growth. Um, uh, you know, really, uh, just to talk about stage first again, and I, sh I should say I'm, a, I'm an investor and advisor in it, but really interesting how you can just jump in with a group of friends and meet in a virtual world. And although it started out as VR, definitely has shifted to flat screen so that it's more accessible. You can do it from your mobile phone. And I, I think we'll see a transformation of that over time as as headsets and, and smart glasses become um easier to use and more affordable and more comfortable and have more content. But I think for a while, our best bet is still going to be engaging on flat screen. DJ Celeste, I'm going to rendezvous over to you. And thank you, Amy. But you play music. You are spinning. You were spinning before we started today. I have to ask, what is that like? So I was introduced into VR um, in 2018 and bought equipment in 2019. Um, and it was perfect timing for 2020. And I actually w uh, fell in love with Wave XR. So Wave used to have a more kind of underground artist friendly um, uh, platform that you could create your custom shows and environments with these wild skyboxes with effects. And you actually, they had a mixer, uh, you had a VJ that worked with you. So I, I would, um, they also had, uh, they're on, they had in-game turntables with music that they provided for you that you could play, or you could just broadcast music. And so uh, as for d virtual worlds, I think that as an artist, um, and I think that artists can really, hone in and create their, these dream stage environments, these wild environments for communities to come in and, ex, and explore and exchange information. Um, my team, I work with Dreamland XR and Chris Cresatelli, and we, we really like alt space for the same reasons where it's accessible on a 2D mode, on a Mac or PC, or with a headset. So if you come in with, these full, with the full immersive experience, our teams just absolutely love to create these wild, fun environments, 3D, 3D environments. And something else that we're going to be seeing a lot of, I think, is the digital twin experience. So say there's a concert at Oracle Arena um, or any, you know, um, Madison Square Gardens, there could very well be a 3D model, a digital twin experience of that same concert, maybe hologram, maybe the band is wearing motion capture and you can see them as holograms um, from, from a um, metaverse and 
um, venue that's the, the same venue. So that's something I think that I, we feel really excited about and we'll see more of in the future. Indeed. To jump onto that, one of my favorite experiences to this day was a company called Next VR um, that was uh, acquired by Apple quite a few years ago. But I was in my living room in San Francisco watching a band at the House of Blues in Boston and my friend was live there in Boston watching the same show, but I was standing behind the drummer and he was standing obviously in front of the stage. And so just to be able to see him in different perspectives of a live show, it was, I'll, I'll never forget it. Tony, what might we expect from future virtual concerts and live performances in the metaverse? Well, I mean, there's a lot. We've, we've touched on the sort of large scale ones you can do in the wave. And I think we're going to see continued progress there. You know, I think, there's a lot of people who would love to get to the level of being able to do the Travis Scott in Fortnite, you know, Ariana Grande in Fortnite, like to get to that for the big acts. But what I was blown away by is as I started following these independent artists for my own selfish reasons, I'm like, what am I going to do? I'm going to launch my own music project. I'm, I'm established in the tech industry, but I'm a nobody in music, right? Do I want to go pay to get a bunch of streams on Spotify? No. So I start following these indie artists. That's how I started following them. And you go to their discord and they'd say, we're doing a Twitter space tomorrow. And you get on this Twitter space and four artists are performing. They're in their place. They're on their mic like I am here. They sound like you sound. It sounds like you're in a coffee house with them. You're getting this intimate performance of singer songwriters sharing their gifts with you. And, you know, maybe there's 100 people on the Twitter space, a small audience, but it was so intimate. So I think we're going to see that whole range of stuff. I'm more personally excited about these smaller venues and more intimate things for two reasons. One, I do think it's a deeper connection for artists. And again, in this new world, I think artists don't need to have millions of fans to have a successful uh, career in the industry. But secondly, also the technologist in me likes it because there are fewer hard technical problems to solve because it's really hard to solve for getting a million people all together online in one place in 3D. It's not even clear that that's desirable or even you know a few hundred thousand like in a big EDM festival. It sounds cool. It sounds like a technology flex. How useful is it for people, though? I wonder. So to me, I love exploring these small communities and, you know, imagine millions of small communities for all these artists or, you know, hundreds of thousands of them. You still get the scale. It's just shaped differently than one big microphone you throw on that's broadcast to a billion people. Let's talk about that for a second. I know, Amy, that you mentioned that Celeste, I want you to go for the answer on here, if you will. And Amy mentioned San Francisco, and she mentioned the House of Blues. And there's all different types of venues that are out there, some of my favorite. We've all heard of maybe the Greek Theater, or maybe Bimbo's 360, or the House of Blues itself, or Showtime at the Apollo. We've heard, you know, Madison Square Garden with Bruce Springsteen, Strum and those good... We've, we've, we've seen what we looked at, let's say, uh, 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 Woodstock, Right. And, and all these different venues, the concerts, it's not only been about the musicians that are performing, but the audiences and the fans. If you look at what we look at reading festival, you know, I mean, we're talking about some major, massive human population coming together. Uh, Celeste, can we see do you might see here in the near future this migration of fandom and culture and audience and venue? translated into XR and will it be as intimate? Well, let's see what, what something we deal with right now in, in, in virtual reality and the metaverse and concert production is called instancing. And we're limited to uh, 25 to 50 avatars, maybe a hundred per instance. And so our teams design our environments, um, uh, specifically with the mind in mind to keep people feeling together because I know the first time that I went into the metaverse I actually was kind of like whoa this is strange I feel really lonely there's no one here um, no one to greet me um, so I think that also having maybe uh, greeters and people that get uh, avatar staff or people that can actually make you feel welcome and orient you um, I, I think that um, something that fans can really look forward to also is the interactivity um, and, and different, like I go to these platforms where there's like icebreaker games that the, the, the creators have, has, have inserted in um, that help new people to connect and be able to talk with each other. Some of the events we did for the United Nations, we were also very adamant about um, coming up with methods 
uh, for interactive activities um, that can bring people together and help them connect. And um, we even had a, we have a language booth for a linguist. We hired a linguist to come in as an avatar uh, that spoke many different languages. Since it was a UN event, we knew we were gonna have people from all over the world coming in. So um, yeah, and for fans, things like that, I think are gonna be very helpful and unifying and inspirational. We're coming down to a couple final questions. And I'm going to ask them individually of each of you in a very specific way, this particular question. Tony, we'll kick off with you. You made the move from Unity, which you were at for many, many years. Um, you have truly been the OG of the metaverse, if you will, uh, self-proclaimed. And you've helped guide this industry. You've recently taken towards new pastures when it comes to new ventures up the road. And you wrote an article in Medium, which I encourage everyone to take a look at. It was endearing. Um, I know many of us have read it. And you also talked about music. You know, here we've known you ever as a technologist for the most part. And as you said, nobody truly knows too much about you with music. The question is this. What does music mean to you? What influence would you personally like to see it have in the metaverse? And how has it affected your very long uh, and very artistic career as a technologist? Uh, I've been playing music since I could walk, literally. I was at a piano at the age of three. Uh, I grew up in a musical family. I actually went to college to study music originally, Berklee College of Music in Boston. Midway through that journey, I decided I did not want to grow up poor like my dad. Um, I was good at math. I learned about these new personal computers that were coming out, and I decided I would take a shot at getting a computer science degree, so I had a hope of having a job. I mean, I had, it's funny. I'd met some folks who were, uh, they had a white-collar job in computing, but they were like, they're wearing T-shirts and shorts. And I said, what do you do for a living? They said, we're computer programmers. I said, that's the job I want. I don't want to work in a bank, some financial institution, an office somewhere. So um, I took the plunge and got a computer science degree. But at that, you know, making that decision was kind of a Faustian bargain because I always had to keep my art off to the side. And so what I hope in the future is that with these technological innovations, fewer artists have to make choices like that going forward. Making, maybe they can be more whole humans where they can nurture their artistic side mm -hmm. and also make a living, not necessarily being full-time artists even, but maybe make, having to make less radical uh, career choices like that or be able to try a few more things um, where the stakes aren't so high, where you don't have that sort of survival anxiety. And I'm Celeste, you can probably speak to it <sighs> as a working yeah. performing <laughs> artist, what that is like. So for me, this I've come full circle now. And I've decided, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that I've, I've succeeded commercially in places like Unity. I can take a little break, take a little time, pick and choose what I want to do in tech. So I'm in a place where I can make some decisions to get more art in my life now after 30 years of pushing it off to the side. So I hope that more and more people can um, avail themselves of more and more choice going forward so they don't have to make such a painful decision like I did when I was young. And we're going to trust that you're bringing some of this disposition with you to Lamina One as well. Absolutely. And my business partner, Neil Stevenson, believes that fully. Obviously, he believes the creator should get paid, uh, him being uh, one of the more famous ones in the world. So, yeah, I'm surely hopeful about that. Thanks for the question, Christopher, and, and the privilege to uh, be here. And before I sign off, shout out to Todd, Aaron, my homies. I see you. I can't type in the chat. I forgot to log in. Definitely. Amy, we'll round it off to you when it comes to the same question. We, I know that you've been such a fan of music, and I absolutely undoubtedly know that we know that this has played a great role with the work that you're doing um, with your fund. What does music mean to you and what influence would you personally like to see it have in the metaverse? Yeah, I mean, music is everything. Uh, it, I love virtual reality and augmented reality and technology and, and uh, I'm interested in climate change, but uh, I can't imagine life without music, uh, maybe even more important than breathing. So, uh, so I'm I I will always whether it be part of the fund or you know like I'm doing now with with the angel investing and advising, um, look to support musicians that are wanting to reach out into this new technology space and figure out how I can help them um, 
uh, both the people that are building platforms for musicians and the musicians themselves. Indeed. Thank you, Amy. DJ Celeste, we asked the same thing of you. You live it. You turn the tables. You're in it. You're building. What does music mean to you and what influence would you personally like to see it have in the metaverse? So, yeah, music is my best friend. It is my driving force. It's been the reason that I wake up. Uh, one of the big main reasons. Um, I, I think that any musician or DJ would say they really, really, one of the ultimate gratifying factors and, and, and missions is to unify people and bring them together to inspire and create hope in a, in a really painful world, right? So the unification is so important. I think that music will ultimately help to breathe life into a metaverse. Uh, it'll be the emotion coming through the digital. It's like the ghost in the machine. Um, it's going to help personalize and bring character to what could be like a dissociative experience. Um, I think in combination with the just brilliant, wild, fun um, visuals that we're going to see, cool avatar costumes. I think that they, they fashion and music really complement each other, I think. So I think we're going to see a lot of the fusion of, of that. And um, yeah, just bringing people more, more together for a common purpose um, in, in the metaverse with these new tools for immersive technology. I have to ask as one final question, and I promise to be super quick with this. Celeste will kick back off to you, then Amy and Tony. Which album that would be one of your favorite albums? Give us one album that's in your top 10. You know, the first thing that comes to mind is actually a Royksop album. It's called Melody AM. And I have had this album through my whole life. And that I've always loved electronic music. And this kind of has a down tempo, moody, melancholic kind of feel. Um, so yeah, Royksop, they're a Scan Scandinavian or Norwegian band. Um, and yeah, I've always loved this album, Melody AM. Check it out. It's gorgeous. Amy? Uh... I guess I'm going to go really retro. Prince is part of my soul. I grew up in Minneapolis. Um, and so I guess I'd go with Purple Rain, like one of the most pivotal yeah. albums in my life. You go wrong. Yeah. <laughs> where are we at? Well, let's go farther in the way back machine. To no one's surprise, if you know me, I'm going to um, cite a David Bowie album, The Rise and Fall of Ziggy Stardust and the Spiders from Mars. It's one of the most iconic. It's absolutely in my Desert Island collection. There it is. Audience, a round of applause for our speakers, for our round table, for our explorers. We have so much to go further today. We hope that you'll stick with us while we go with a small break. I want to personally express our gratitude and thank you for joining and exploring us today, Amy, Celeste, and Tony. We hope that you continue to push the good fight of music and metaverse, and we look forward to seeing of your endeavors to come. Take care and start well. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thanks, you guys. Happy to share.
Oh, <laughs> 